everybody. Today's video is sponsored by HelloFresh. But first... into this video, there is a very good chance that, like myself, you grew up lusting after one of the Ferrari supercars, the 288 GTO, the F40, the F50, the Enzo, the LaFerrari, or just LaFerrari, as they prefer you to call it. But there is also a good chance that, like myself, 25 years ago, it seemed possible that maybe one day one of those could be yours because the F40 at one point cost just under £200,000, the F50 £300,000, and while those were still very, very big numbers, they were nowhere near the crazy figures that the cars fetch today. However, here I'm going to be giving you a look at a dream Ferrari with a difference. This is a 1970s Pininfarina pinup with a screaming, naturally aspirated V8 behind me and the classic gated shifter in the middle. Yet, unlike the F40, this one might actually be affordable. So, what is it? What makes it special? And is it worth it? All this and more in today's episode of JM on Cars. Roll the funky music. <laughs> As I'm fairly certain that before clicking on this video you read the title, you'll already know that what we have here is a Ferrari 308 GTB. The 308 being the first two-seater mid-engined V8 Ferrari to actually wear the name. This car's predecessor being the much-loved 206 and 246 Dino, never badged as a Ferrari. It is spun off the same platform that gave us the 308 GT4, the 2 Plus 2 version, which initially also carried the Dino name, then later, after this was introduced, finally also called a Ferrari. Now, as you have probably guessed, this car is not entirely standard, and there are in fact a number of things that make it noteworthy. The first of which is that this being an early European specification 308 GTB, it is in fact one of the 308 Vetro Resinas. In other words, it's actually made out of fiberglass. The chassis was tubular steel, as was Ferrari tradition of the time, and the bonnet is aluminium, but the rest of it, fiberglass reinforced plastic. In spite of this, as with all other Ferraris, they were still constructed by Carrozzeria Scaglietti in a somewhat time-consuming process. It is worth pointing out that the GTS, the Spider or Target Top version, was always built with a steel body and, as of 1977, so was the GTB. But for the first two years, this was the body they got. By Ferrari standards, the 308 was a very popular car, with some 6,000 being made before it turned into the 328. However, just 800 of them were built with the fiberglass shell. I do believe that our friends across the pond got a number of fiberglass cars. However, what they and just about anybody else outside Europe did not get was a dry sumped engine, which this car also has. So that's just two noteworthy things about this car as it left the factory way back in 1976. But as I'm sure you can tell, a few things have happened since then. But before I get onto those, I think we should have a little listen to our friends over in the V8 Orchestra. one of the greatest road car experiences of my life. Before I get on to exactly what this car is, I'm going to address the elephant in the room. I'm sure a few of you have already commented on this. In fact, I myself have mentioned in many, 
many videos that to drive a road car with a full cage, you would be insane. Happily, this one is slightly padded, but still, it's not ideal. Nor is the fact that to see out of this car easily, I have had to slouch quite a bit. But I will say that this lovely bucket seat fits me really nicely, as do the harnesses. Once I got into the car, it wasn't actually all that bad. Sorry, the synchro on fifth is uh, not great. Nor is the clutch. It's fine, but it's um, a very heavy duty one and uh, getting off the line is not the easiest. It's uh, quite an unpleasant task actually. Anyway, this car was purchased way back in 2005 as a project by its current owner, Jai, who previously brought me the lovely blue Countach that I drove last year. So, as I'm sure you can tell, he is a man of great taste. It was in such a state that he decided trying to rebuild it as a road car wasn't going to be particularly easy. So, he acquired it with the intention of going racing. He had the car put back together and he had the engine rebuilt. As original, these allegedly put out about 255 horsepower. In reality, it may have been quite a bit less. It's a 2.9 litre with 16 valves and a brace of carburettors. However, this is no longer standard. It still has carburettors, but it also has titanium con rods, uprated camshafts, oversized pistons, and a red line of 9,000 RPM. It makes just the 295 horsepower, but it also weighs just 1175 kilos. So I think for most people, we can call that adequate. It's certainly enough to put a big smile on this face. In any case, the car actually isn't as modified as you might be expecting. I know it's all stripped out and racery and with numbers on the side, but the series in which it competed between 2007 and 2019 was the HSCC series for 1970s road cars, and the rules for modifications are fairly strict. So the car still has its 15-inch diameter wheels and with tyres that are only 225 section front and rear. They are Toyo R888Rs though, so I'm very grateful that it's dry. Naturally, there are no driver aids, ABS or power steering, because the car never had those anyway. The dogleg gearbox is also as original, and to be fair, it's actually really, really quite nice to use. It's just the clutch, which has a very, very high biting point, and that's why I am making, on occasion, a bit of a mess of things. Oh, that was my best launch yet. Tell you what, I'm also gonna turn the headlights on. Pop-ups. Yes, <laughs> who doesn't love pop-ups? The brakes likewise, the car has uprated pads, but not discs or calipers because that's against the rules. The exhaust is certainly a lot more free flowing and I'm hoping you're getting a little bit of it today. Trying to rig a camera to get the noise for this was not easy. The way the rear is laid out means I don't really have many places to put one. So uh, if it's not the best, I apologize. I've already mentioned the seats and I'm sure you can see the harnesses as well. The car no longer has its original three points and very frustratingly, I've only just noticed this, on occasion, if I sort of breathe out, the wheel will just for a moment catch the release for this down here, which is terribly dangerous and um, I'm not really sure I can do anything about, but maybe off camera in a moment I will. Yeah, that's sorted. We've had to slouch and tighten these a little bit more and shift things about, but uh, I think we've solved the problem. So, on with the modifications. The springs are uprated, and as you might imagine, a little stiffer than standard. The dampers are different too, now adjustable and with the better platforms, I think I was told. And then to round it off, you've got the obligatory cage, cutoff switches, and the weight saving courtesy of just throwing a few bits in the bin. All in then, really, it's not radically different from standard. This is no Michelotto X race car. It is essentially a road going car with some bits thrown at it. And ordinarily, I would tell you that would be a terrible, terrible thing to do to a classic Ferrari or a modern one. Yet. <laughs> Thank you. 
This is a really special experience, driving a race prepped manual classic Ferrari as the sun is setting, the skyline looks beautiful because the tractors are out kicking a bit of dust up from the fields and it's a time like these I'm reminded of just how lucky I am. Lucky to have a sponsor like HelloFresh. With the summer we've had, I need all the time I can get to film videos like this, and using HelloFresh gives me that. They have a huge range of tasty meals to choose from, including vegetarian, low calorie and plenty of other options too, like this curry couscous which was delicious and under 650 calories per portion. That's the same as a relatively small fast food burger, but far more filling. Your ingredients arrive all neatly arranged and portioned for you, cutting out the boring bit of cooking, the shopping, weighing and measuring, leaving you to do the fun bit. HelloFresh has helped renew my passion in the kitchen and even given me a bit of extra time to develop new skills. Best of all, you can try it yourself using my discount code for an amazing 60% off your first box and 25% off the next eight and they have meal options to suit most tastes and dietary requirements. So what are you waiting for? Well, I suppose, the ad to end and the video to continue. So, let's get on with it. The response from this engine is incredible. The bark you get from that induction setup and those carburetors just dragging air and fuel in, just stuffing it down into the cylinders is amazing. It's actually a lot louder in here than it is from outside. That transversely mounted V8 is basically just behind my head and there's not really a lot between me and it, so no surprise really. The steering, oh the steering. I've spoken so many times about how Ferrari steering is really, really quite inconsistent. This though is just wonderful. It's delicate, quite quick. I think the rack in here is non-standard too. Weights up beautifully. You do have to respect it. It's not my car, it's worth a lot of money. But, oh my, I'd love to tell you how fast I'm going, but I actually don't know. The speedo's broke, but I'm doing seven. The brakes have developed a bit of a judd, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. That might be because the original discs are not really up to track day and racing abuse, but uh, it's nothing I've done, honestly. This is amazing. It feels so, so special. A change at eight. Oh, oh, oh my word. This makes the 430 Scuderia feel like comfy old armchair. Oh. The fact that I'm on the wrong side of the car too is honestly not an issue, it's such a tiny little thing that you can see out of it just fine. This is so, so cool. I am not in love, I am in pure, unashamed, adulterous lust. If at this point in time the 430 developed a gammy leg, I'd take it out the back, shoot it, claim the insurance money and make giant offer for this. What's quite problematic is the fact that he might actually be selling it. And that's a good enough time as any to talk to you about how much this car is worth, because I know you've been wondering that all along. These cars I mentioned earlier, the F40, the F50, 288 GTO, unless you're talking millions, you ain't getting even close to one. Unless you're at a Rossa, of course, and you're probably gonna build one out of, I don't know, a box of scraps like the A-Team. In any case, an F40 is what, two million, an F53, and a 288 GTO, heaven forbid. This one, 150 grand, yeah. Less than a new 911 GT3, certainly once the uh, second hand market has gotten a hold of it. Far less than, well, any new Ferrari, far less than a Huracan. It is sad to say, but 150 grand when it comes to cars is not the amount it used to be. More worryingly, the 430 Scuderia, that's worth more. And yes, if you want to travel up to Scotland, you want to do some big touring and that sort of stuff, this is not really the place to do it. I am having a whale of a time, but I've been driving this car now for 29 minutes. 
And I know that a bit like the Kuntash, once I've got out, I'll be very thankful to Jai. I'll hand the keys back and go, ha, that was great. That is once I've extracted myself out of the car. And if you'd like to see that, stick around to the end. As I've mentioned it, I suppose it's worth drawing comparison with the Kuntash. This probably isn't quite as fast. That really was impressive in the way it covered ground once it was on song. But still, it's pretty decent. Jai said he did some sort of cigarette packet maths and worked out this has got now the power to weight ratio of a Testarossa, which is still healthy. I know the modern world has changed our perceptions of what's fast or not, but it's still enough. Trust me. The brakes, yeah, okay, there's the wobble, but they're powerful. They bite. The steering, beautiful, nicely weighted, much, much easier to drive than the Countach, this car. You get a lot of faith in it as well. I am still being somewhat cautious with the car, though, probably needlessly so. It's on corner exit where I'm just being careful not to upset it. I'm just wary of the fact that those rears, I know they've got grippy rubber, but they just aren't that wide. The gear shift is lovely. Slow into fifth, just so it doesn't graunch, but... <laughs> Oh my life. I also feel like this car is basically built for these roads. It is on the firm side, you do feel that. It's not as supple as the 430, but that has fancy pants modern electronic adaptive dampers. This does not, and honestly, it's just nowhere near as bad as I thought it was gonna be. I expect this cage may actually be adding a bit of rigidity to the car and possibly helping it, but if I did have one of these, that that would have to go. Annoyingly, I, I couldn't actually fit in here with a helmet on, so it's uh, kind of pointless. Do you care about fuel economy? No. Do you care about the fact that the uh, aircon doesn't work? No. I do a little bit. Do you care about the fact that the horn doesn't work? Well, um, that is going to be irksome, that doesn't need fixing, but uh, I'm sure you don't. I also love just how rough and ready this car's exterior is. It's a proper racer, not some sort of tribute act, you know, with a few stickers on it. It's the real deal. I love the fact there's bits of damage here and there. There's bits of issue with the paintwork. Oh, and if you're wondering how you spot a fiberglass 308 easily, well, first off, it's gotta be an early GTB, so a coupe. And up here, just before you get to the roof line, you'll see just a little sort of indent. The fiberglass cars have that, the metal ones do not. Finding information on these was surprisingly difficult, and the biggest problem is just how wildly differing many of the numbers you get are. One source said that these cars weighed 1,050 kilos, which is just not true. Others said they weighed about 1,350, which is also likely not true. In reality, I think a regular road-going Vectro Resina is about 1,250 kilos, give or take. This one then, 1,175, but it's a race car. It's had stuff taken out of it including the aircon. The fact that in this era, European and American specification cars were also wildly different just doesn't help either. This car is a European original, though it did spend some time in the United States before returning here in the very early 90s. I honestly, I, I don't really know what more to say about it. I'm sure I've left so, so much out, but if I've done one thing today, I hope it's to have conveyed just how cool and special this thing is and the fact that these cars are out there I, I just love that I'm sure if I'd got something like this and there was a possibility of just returning it to regular road car spec I, I would have gone that route but the combo of the engine and the chassis here now I've sampled this I'm not sure I'd actually want it any different I'm not fussed about the fiberglass bit that doesn't bother me Incidentally, no one was really ever sure why Ferrari moved away from it. Some said that people weren't happy with the quality of the finish of the body panels and the paintwork. Others said that maybe there were issues with the electrical system and fiberglass cars have never been good for that. And some say it's simply the fact that uh, Ferrari wanted to build the cars a little cheaper and the fiberglass was expensive. <laughs> I know, Jack from number 27 is thinking of selling the world famous Influenzo, but I'm pretty confident he's gonna look at this video and go, hmm, that's the car I wish I had. Come on, Jack, a minute. Hop into the comment section, Jack, come on. And if you're not Jack, also hop into the comment section. Anyway, the sun is setting and I've had a great day. And I'm just gonna try and enjoy this car for a little bit longer. In any case, I want to say a huge thank you to Jai for bringing it out, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, and subscribe if you haven't already. 
I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.